procedures. Nine-month-old Amy Corley is back home but is still unwell. She was taken to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital this week, lifeless, with a raging temperature. Her GP had warned the hospital she was due to arrive, but when she did, she was assessed in her parents' car in the car park for 70 minutes. To then be told potentially she had swine flu and then just be treated in that respect. I mean, we didn't know what was going on. Everything came as a shock. We'd just come from work. And uh, for anybody to be left in a, in a car at any time of the year was, was questionable. Once admitted onto the children's ward, Amy's parents say the staff couldn't do enough during the 38 hours she was there. But they can't understand why she was treated so badly when she first arrived. Most hospitals have signs warning people with suspected swine flu not to enter. But the Queen Elizabeth Hospital admits this time it got it wrong. In context, it was a very busy evening. Uh, we were finding it quite difficult to unload our ambulances. But nevertheless, to um, have to examine a child in the car park um, of a winter's night is not ideal practice. And we will be looking very carefully at our procedures as a consequence of this child's experience. Amy's parents just want their daughter to get better. The hospital has promised to give them a copy of their investigation. Debbie Tubby, Beebs East, Norfolk. Two cousins from Essex have been extradited to Cyprus today to serve prison sentences for manslaughter. Michael Binnington and Luke Atkinson, who live in Whitham, failed to block the extradition in the High Court. They were passengers in a car which hit a moped three years ago. A Cypriot teenager was killed. Two people arrested on suspicion of murdering a woman from Ipswich have been released without charge. In August, the body of Rosalind Hunt was found dead at her home in Victoria Street. Three other people, a 15-year-old girl and two men, have already been charged with murder. The former Norwich MP Ian Gibson has told Look East he's still waiting to be told why he was sacked from the Labour Party. It's six months since Dr Gibson was barred from standing as a candidate following revelations about his expenses. By his own admission, it's been a weird six months for Ian Gibson. One moment he was playing a key role in the Labour Party. The next, he was out of a job. As they say in the States, I was dumped on. How would you feel about that? I might have made an error of judgement, I should have kept out of it. Oh yes, all that can be said. But I don't feel guilty in any way, not at all. I don't feel I was cheating the taxpayer and certainly not my constituents. He was summoned before the party's so-called star chamber after the Daily Telegraph revealed that his daughter lived in his London flat for which he claimed parliamentary expenses. And after a 20-minute hearing, he was told he could no longer be a Labour candidate, so he decided to resign. Yet he still doesn't think he did anything wrong. Having my daughter living with me for the time that she did uh, was quite important to me in many ways, coming out of that... Uh, is, you know, bedlam of the House of Commons and doing the things that I did and working at the pace I did, it was nice to come home and talk about normal things. But the argument was that you were using taxpayers' money to subsidise your family, your daughter and her boyfriend, to stay in your house. Well, that's right, you know, and, uh, you know, you just wonder, you know, how many people have been involved in that in their lives when they've got a home. And have you yet been told why you were suspended from I'm the I'm still Party? waiting for the letter. You're still, still to waiting to be told. I'm still waiting for the letter to be told in black and white. That's the standard practice, I thought, in, uh, as part of your human rights. So, other than the phone call which you got the day the Star Chamber decided to suspend you, you have had nothing in writing... I have had nothing in writing at all. I've not heard anything, anything more than, than just that 20-second phone call. How do you feel about that? Strange. I mean, usually, you know, you would uh, get a letter or, and ask for a letter at the time. He's once again backing political causes. He spoke at a recent climate change rally and he's involved with several charities. He told me he's been approached by other political parties, but he's no plans to join them yet. Andrew Sinclair, BBC Look East. The planning inspector leading a public inquiry into the duelling of the A11 in Suffolk has been travelling along the road today with objectors. An eight-mile stretch of the road is the last undrilled section between Norwich and London. It is notorious for delays. Today, the inspector has been examining parts of the proposed route with officials from the Highways Agency and objectors. Now, what do Marty Pello, David Hasselhoff and John Barrowman have in common? The answer, they've all starred in Chicago in the West End. Well, now the show is coming to Norwich with another star. Our entertainment reporter, Dawn Gerber, has been to meet him. 
She's gonna be a celebrity. It's the roaring 1920s and nightclub singer Roxy Hart has shot her lover. And here begins the musical Chicago, created by John Kander and Fred Ebb. Gary Wilmot, who's no stranger to the stage, has taken on the smooth-talking role of the lawyer Billy Flynn. I first saw Chicago, this production of Chicago in London when it first opened with the fantastic Henry Goodman playing Billy Flynn and from that moment I thought, that's what I want to do. He's a very slick talker, he knows the law inside out, has never lost a case uh, and that's the way I try and do it, hopefully without coming across too smug. Where'd you come from? Mississippi. Chicago originates from a play written by the reporter Maureen Dallas Watkins, who was covering a murder trial in 1924. But the first Broadway production opened on the 3rd of June 1975 and ran for a total of 936 performances. I want, when I go to the theatre or watch television, I want something that's going to stimulate me and mass massage my emotions, if you like. And, uh, and Chicago certainly does that. Yesterday was, the, was your opening night. How did that go? And being here at the Theatre Royal... That is brilliant. It's been, I've been here quite a few times now over the years and, uh, and it's always a great venue to come, come to. I always wonder when I walk on the stage whether I'm going to get a round of applause and here I'm delighted to say that happens, you know. Uh, recognition is a, is a wonderful boost for, for the evening and uh, um, just as a message to all the audience members for the rest, of the, for the rest of the week, a round of applause on my entrance is really, really good. <laughs> Makes me feel good, and you'll get a better show as a result, you know. <laughs> Gary, lovely to meet you. It's good to meet you too. A rape victim from Cambridge has been paid compensation by the police after they failed to properly investigate the attack. The woman received £3,500 after she threatened legal action against detectives. Tonight's special report is from June Kelly. Catherine says the man who raped her knew he was targeting a particularly vulnerable woman. They'd only just met. She has mental health problems and was in a fragile state. She first spoke to the police in Cambridge two months later. A delay in reporting is not unusual in rape cases. She describes how two months after that she contacted the police to find out how the investigation was going. Nothing at all had been done. The paperwork had been left forgotten on an officer's desk. I was the woman of no importance. I'm absolutely sure that I was treated differently because I had a mental health problem. Not only had I been attacked, but I actually had been totally betrayed by the police force who are actually paid to protect. Rape allegations are difficult for the police to investigate, but in this case, officers could have had a vital lead. Catherine says that after the rape, her attacker forced her to come here to this cash point and ordered her to withdraw 200 pounds. Now all this should have been caught on camera and could have been used as evidence. But the delay with the police investigation meant that by the time detectives contacted the bank, all the CCTV footage from that day had been wiped. Catherine's lawyer, Harriet Wistrich, was preparing to sue the Cambridgeshire force over their failure to investigate when they agreed to settle out of court. In a highly unusual move, she was going to use the Human Rights Act. These sorts of cases are very new, um, but I hope more will be brought because it's a good way of holding police to account for failures to investigate. Catherine has received £3,500 in compensation. One officer denied her mental health problems played a part in the failure to investigate. He and a colleague have been disciplined. The force has apologised. June Kelly, BBC News, Cambridge. Well, we're going back to Kandahar now for the latest dispatch from Alex Dunlop.